Hello, everybody. Uh, this is a criminal procedure adjudication video topic. It's uh, linked to Chapter 5, Part B1 in the Miller and Wright text. Uh, we're talking about pre-accusation delay. This is part of a larger subject of speedy preparation for trial. And for pre-accusation delay, we're focusing on that period of time between the day when the crime happens and the day when the charges are filed. Within that period of time, uh, we have legal rules that recognize conflicting impulses. On the one hand, we know that justice delayed is justice denied. There are certain provisions of law that say, hurry up, get this thing done. It'll be a more reliable, more accurate process if you do. On the other hand, haste makes waste. Don't go too fast. Uh, so we try to accommodate those, uh, those conflicting impulses. The two important sources of law here are constitutional law and more important, statutory law. So we'll be surveying both of those. Away we go. Now, by far the most important legal uh, limitation on the filing of charges, the timing of that filing, come from statutes of limitations. If you just take a tour of the codes of the criminal codes of the different states, you will generally find statutes of limitations, and they have many common features as you go from state to state. This New York statute is typical uh, in that way. So one thing to notice is that there are different uh, time periods depending on how serious the, uh, the crime is. So if you're talking about uh, a felony, uh, uh, other than a class A felony, then you've got to uh, get the charges filed within five years. If you're talking about a misdemeanor in New York, then within two years for a petty offense within uh, one year. And then New York's uh, law here is, is uh, typical in that it does reserve a few crimes, in this case, all the class A felonies, uh, to say that there is no statute of limitations. So you may have heard in melodramatic television scripts, there is no statute of limitations for murder. And that's generally true under, uh, under state law. Now, if you think of these uh, statutes of limitations as stopwatch, uh, there are legal rules about the, the trigger, that is, when does the stopwatch begin? Uh, and then there are rules about tolling, that is, when does the stopwatch temporarily stop before you can start it again and notice how much time is elapsing. So let's begin with the uh, specialized trigger rules. There are certain crimes uh, that uh, you don't really even know when they initially happen or the world is not supposed to know when they happen. And so we delay the start of the, uh, of the statute of limitations for those crimes. So a classic example would be an employee uh, who embezzles from the employer, somebody who has a uh, fiduciary uh, duty. So we have here in subsection A these fiduciary uh, duty crimes. Because the crime itself is meant to be hidden and not discovered, we don't look to the, uh, to the actual commission of the offense. Instead, we look uh, to that time when the offense should have been discovered by the aggrieved party as long as they're behaving non-negligently, as long as they're using reasonable diligence. Another special category of crime here would be sexual offenses against children. It's the very nature of these crimes that the, uh, the victim is told you have to remain quiet and you very often don't learn about these things until the child grows older and looks back on these events and realizes, hey, something was wrong there. Uh, and so we say for these crimes that the clock does not start until these uh, children grow older and uh, we can more reasonably expect that they would speak up about, uh, about what had happened. So the, the triggers are specialized for uh, a few kinds of crimes. For the other kinds of crimes, it's just the date when the, when the crime uh, happened. And then there are also the tolling rules, that is the clock freezes occasionally. So the, the clock has begun, the crime has happened, or the other triggering event has happened, the clock is moving, and then certain things will freeze the clock and say, we're not going to count this time against the government. Uh, one of the classics is, is, is if the, uh, the defendant leaves the uh, jurisdiction. And so the New York statute uh, offers an example uh, there. Uh, another example would be if the state actually files charges, uh, on this, as to this transaction, but then has to dismiss charges for some reason, but consistent with the double jeopardy rules, they're still allowed to refile charges later. In that situation, in, at least in many states, the original uh, period of the filing of the, uh, the first unsuccessful charges do not count in the statute of limitations period. That period is told. There's a freezing of the clock. In addition to these statutes and limitations, there's also constitutional doctrine based here in the Due Process Clause. Uh, and so the U.S. Supreme Court in uh, United States versus Marion from 1971 and then later United States versus Lovasco uh, has said that 
even if a prosecution is consistent with this, the local statute of limitations, uh, nevertheless, it might be a violation of due process if the government waits too long under certain circumstances. Two-part test here. First, you're asking, was there an unreasonable delay? Uh, and the unreasonableness of the delay is a function both of just how long is the delay and what were the reasons for the delay. So you combine the, the length and the reasons together to ask, was there an unreasonable delay? And then second, you ask, was there some prejudice to the defendant that resulted from this uh, delay? And you see from United States versus Lavasco here uh, that we've got several different factors here that uh, uh, bear on the question of the, uh, of the reasonableness of the delay and in particular what the government's reasons were for waiting around for so long before filing the uh, charges. This whole list, notice this is a very familiar ground. These are the things that one would think about as a prosecutor in deciding whether to file charges or to decline charges initially. So a very familiar mode of thinking goes into this after the fact evaluation of whether the government had good reasons for waiting around. The text illustrates this due process doctrine at work uh, in a Pennsylvania case, Commonwealth versus Share from 2002. Uh, the case became famous, scandalous. This happens pretty often when you combine wealth and adultery and murder and, uh, well, maybe I shouldn't say that. At any rate, the, uh, the shooting happened in uh, 1976. Uh, uh, Stephen Scher, a doctor who was then in his mid-30s, fairly new arrival to the small town in northeastern Pennsylvania, shot his friend Martin Dillon in the chest. Uh, in the sh it was a fatal shot. Uh, Dillon was a lawyer with a general practice, an emphasis on real estate and estate planning practice, but he uh, also did a little bit of criminal uh, defense work. Uh, the death happened while the men were shooting clay pigeons uh, near the, uh, the Dillon family cabin, which was named Gunsmoke, possibly uh, invoking a television series of that uh, era. And at the time, Dr. Scher claimed that this was an accident. He said, my gun went off when Martin grabbed it and ran into, uh, ran into the brush uh, looking for a porcupine. We were out. He thought he could use the gun to, you know, we were hunting. Uh, in addition to shooting the, the, the skeets. Uh, and he just accidentally shot himself. That was uh, Scher's original claim. Now, some of the physical evidence didn't really match Scher's account. Uh, for instance, uh, the doctor, Dr. Grace, who conducted the autopsy, noted that there were no apparent signs of gunpowder burns on Dylan's chest. And that would have happened if the, uh, if the gun had discharged with Martin himself holding it at very close range to himself. The angle of the wound also suggested that the shot came from overhead and traveled down, which would, was difficult to square with the way that, uh, with the way that Cher described the, uh, the accidental shooting uh, happening. It was also odd that could, because the police noted that the, uh, that the pellets that were in the shotgun at the time came from a 16 gauge high powered shell that you usually use for larger game every other shell that was in the gun was appropriate for skeet shooting. Uh, just the one shell was uh, this high powered uh, shell. Uh, ultimately though, even with this conflicting evidence, the county coroner, uh, Connerton ruled that, the, uh, that Dylan's death was a uh, self-inflicted accidental uh, shooting. Now it wasn't that long before people in town were whispering about this uh, case, it was, uh, not settling down, people were talking about potential uh, adultery between uh, Cher and Dylan's wife, uh, Patricia, pointing to that as a possible motive for murder. Cher and his, his then wife, Anne, did divorce uh, just after the shooting. Uh, in, ironically, Anne had actually attempted suicide on the day of the murder before she knew about the, uh, the, the shooting. And when she was told about Dylan's death, Anne said, he killed him, didn't he? Uh, two years later, uh, Cher married uh, uh, Dylan's widow, uh, Pat, uh, Patricia, who was a nurse uh, who had met Dr. Cher at the hospital where she worked, or where the two of them worked. Uh, and together they raised uh, the two uh, children that uh, Dylan had had with uh, Patricia. Uh, they moved to New Mexico and lived there uh, between, uh, well, uh, th through 1991 and then to North Carolina later on. Uh, but Martin Dillon's father, Lawrence, persisted. He was the former mayor of the Montrose Township, influential guy. 
never believed that this was an accidental shooting and he kept uh, pecking away at the, uh, at the case. He did so as different district attorneys and different coroners came and went in office. He would approach them each at the start of their uh, term and say, I want you to rethink this case. I believe it was uh, really a murder. Soon after the uh, election of, of a new DA, Lawrence Dillon, the father, hired a, uh, a new, uh, his own private uh, forensic expert who conducted uh, tests with shotguns uh, and concluded that the pattern of wounds that were observed during the autopsy on Martin Dillon's body were really inconsistent with a self-inflicted wound with that uh, shotgun. Uh, that, along with the lingering other forensic doubts, were represented to a panel of experts that the, uh, that the elected DA convened in this case. The panel still concluded by a strong majority that the, the best interpretation of the evidence overall was that it was uh, accidental, that it was not a criminal matter. Uh, and so that's the way the, the DA was going to go forward. But more evidence continued to, uh, to pile up as the Dillon family uh, was persistent and the, the Pennsylvania State Police uh, got involved adding to the, uh, to the investigative file. And then in 1995, the body was exhumed, uh, sorry, exhumed uh, over the objections of Patricia Scher, the former wife of uh, Martin Dillon, uh, for a second autopsy. And based on uh, some new techniques. The autopsy report by Dr. Uh, Mihalikas concluded that uh, Martin Dillon could not have shot himself. Uh, at that point, uh, Patricia Scher arranged for a second exhumation and a third autopsy of the body to be done by defense experts. The uh, district attorney decided to file charges and we ultimately have 1996 charges leading to a 1997 trial. In the 1997 trial, Scher admitted somewhat dramatically that his earlier story was false. In, instead of Martin being off on his own when the gun went off, he said, actually, I did tell him for the first time about the, uh, the affair going on between me and his wife. He was upset. He had a gun. I reached back to grab it because I didn't think he should be holding a gun at that point. We struggled over the gun and it went off. Accidentally, he died. Now, uh, Cher was convicted in this 1997 trial. The, uh, the verdict was overturned originally in, in an intermediate appellate court, but then it was uh, upheld here in this 2002 opinion of the uh, Pennsylvania Supreme Court against a claim of improper delay between the, uh, the crime and the charge. Later on, uh, the defendant pursued another ground for appeal, and the Pennsylvania Sup Supreme Court did order a new trial in uh, 2004 because of uh, an improper dismissal of, a, of an emotional juror during deliberations. And so there was a new trial in 2008, but then a, a, a conviction for murder after the uh, 2008 trial as well. And Dr. Scher died uh, of natural causes at age uh, 70 uh, in the Laurel Highlands State Correctional Institute. Now remember, under the due process uh, doctrine involved here, you ask whether there was an unreasonable delay, which is a function both of the length of the delay and the reasons for the delay. And then second, was there some kind of prejudice that came from the, uh, from the delay? Uh, so what were Scher's claims about the prejudice uh, element? He said, an important part of my case here is the viability of the original coroner's report that called it an accident. And he said there have the, the, the length of time involved has made it much more difficult for me to uh, defend that original coroner's uh, report. For one thing, most importantly, the coroner himself has died. Uh, in addition, the state has lost the audio recording of the original autopsy, which would have been very good evidence to sort of reconstruct what the doctor was thinking rather than just relying on the bare conclusions of the, uh, of the report. In addition, some photographs of the scene had been, uh, had been lost. And he says, 20 years, the decomposition of the body makes it tougher now to confirm with the current physical evidence what was, uh, you know, showing up in the recordings and the reports based on the original autopsy. As you know, the, uh, the court ended up rejecting this argument, saying that, uh, that this is not prejudicial uh, because there were other methods of, of uh, proving the accident theory. Uh, even though Connerton wasn't uh, available, uh, Cher did have experts at trial who explained his theory based on the available uh, photographs and the report. 
uh, and their own uh, examination of the now somewhat decomposed uh, body. Now, obviously, the, uh, the length of the delay here is extraordinary, and so uh, that would contribute very heavily to a finding of an unreasonable delay. But on the other hand, the reasons for that delay uh, were something that saved the, uh, the case uh, for, the, uh, for the government here. So the government had a number of legitimate reasons for waiting. Um, initially, there was some serious question, of it, some serious doubt about the guilt of the, uh, the defendant. After all, the defendant was a respected physician. He claimed innocence. That seemed plausible to a number of the early uh, investigators. There may also have been some concern by the prosecution about uh, improper motives of a complainant. This was, after all, a powerful family in town. A very persistent former mayor was, was really pressing for, uh, for some kind of action. Cher was kind of an outsider to the town, a Canadian, one of the few Jews in town. You can imagine a DA being reluctant to, uh, to uh, go forward on the basis of uh, the urging of very powerful local people, unless you have you know, yourself enough evidence to be convinced that, uh, that it's the fair thing to do to, to move forward in the, uh, in the case. The prosecution might also have pointed to the reluctance of certain family members to testify. You know, you have the, the victim's wife who was at the time in an adulterous affair, uh, and she may have been reluctant to testify at the time. The defendant's wife, who may have known about the, uh, the adultery, uh, was suicidal at the time and may not have uh, been especially anxious to, be, uh, to testify. Now, what about possible improper motives? Well, if you look back to the Lavasco case, uh, the court emphasized that it needed to be intentional delay. This, the uh, Pennsylvania court here debates whether some kind of reckless delay might be sufficient, and in, we end up not needing to resolve that uh, based on the facts here. Uh, but in the, on the Lavasco facts, there was, uh, there was some discussion of the government's uh, uh, desire to, quote, hold a club over the defendant's head, hoping to induce the defendant to cooperate in other uh, investigations. Uh, possibly another improper motive would be trying to postpone the beginning of a defense investigation. Uh, maybe then the, uh, uh, the evidence would, you know, the witnesses would go away or the evidence would deteriorate in some way. Awfully hard to make the case for any of these in this case, except maybe for deterioration of the, uh, of the evidence. But again, if you're looking for something along the lines of intentional or maybe reckless behavior by the state, um, we just, uh, you know, it's hard to find that uh, in this case. And so the court ends up concluding that uh, on, the, on the due process ground, there was no, uh, no, was no violation here, even though it was a 20 year delay. So I do want you to notice with this doctrine just how uh, unlikely it is that a defendant is going to succeed. Uh, because if you're looking for some kind of reconstruction of prosecutor motives, normally the court doesn't like to get into that. They just look to the objective actions that police officers and prosecutors take, as we see throughout uh, the doctrine of criminal procedure. Uh, the statute of limitations typically is a far more lively legal limit on pre-accusation delay than this uh, due process uh, doctrine ever does. Because at the end of the day, there are these powerful presumptions of proper motives that uh, attach to the work of prosecutors, police, other government officials. You might be able to, to uh, disprove that, to uh, rebut the presumption, but you would need some you know, smoking gun. Uh, you would need uh, some kind of admission by the prosecutor that some kind of uh, discovery advantage or plea bargaining or sentencing advantage was the principal reason uh, for the delay in the charges. You're just very rarely going to get that kind of uh, overt admission from a uh, prosecutor. So that's, uh, that's it for this topic. We move on now to, uh, to speedy trial rights after uh, the accusation, after the, the start of the charges.